Hi, my name is Eric Kinzel, and I want you to rethink your assumptions on water conservation. This is Jessica, my daughter. She's a Girl Scout Brownie, and right now she has this book about wonders of water. It teaches all about conservation, and she keeps telling me, you gotta turn off the faucet, keep it like a run. Because, you know, after all, water is important to saving the planet, yada yada. Well, there's one bit of a problem. <laughs> all the stuff we do at home, and all the stuff in the book, doesn't really help. So, but what really is the problem is because what we, what the water we waste here is not the real problem. Because we're only using 17% of all water consumed goes to uh, the use for us. The real problem is food. That's right. Would you believe it takes 70% of all the water consumed to grow our own food? So if we want any hope at all of solving this problem, we need to rethink our assumptions on farming and we need to revolutionize how we do agriculture. And throw in climate change, and really, we are living on borrowed time. There are, there are, so what about solutions? There have been some advancements in farming, you know, so we have a lot higher efficient farming to produce higher yields. But the trouble is we're still wasting water. And of course, what about micro-irrigation? Uses less water, but now you're a lot more inefficient and requires more uh, labor costs. Greenhouses, greenhouses are a great solution. They are no water evaporation, not affected by droughts or floods, and clean and organic food. That's much better, but there's still problems. The problem is they're not very efficient. So you got problems with pollination issues, higher labor costs, and limits on the economy of scale. But we can do better. What we need is a process that we take all the benefits of the greenhouse farming and all the efficiencies of the modern agriculture that we have. So what if we take what we currently have in the automotive industry and apply it to agriculture? And that's exactly what we're developing right now. What we have is through years of research in computer vision and robot prototyping, our goal is to completely automate farming from seed to harvest in an enclosed environment. But the question is, really, how is this solving the problem? Because right now we've taken a tomato that normally costs $1 and you add on all this extra stuff, of course, it's going to be a $25 tomato, right? <coughs> well, let's do the math on that. Okay, so a traditional farm does 36,000 pounds per acre. But half the yield is wasted because of disease, insects, pests. So right now you're doubling the yield. With robotic farming, robots can pollinate much more efficiently. You can actually pollinate every petal many times daily. Let's just add 15%. And with computer vision, you can tell when a tomato is ripe, so you don't get any loss due to overripe or underripe tomatoes. Okay, let's be conservative, 20%. Now here comes the interesting part. Because this is sealed, because it's a known self-contained environment, you don't need people, you can actually change the CO2 levels to where uh, they're much higher. And when you can increase the CO2 levels and have high efficiency LEDs right up to the plants at 15 to 18 hours a day, you can double the yields, but let's be conservative for a minute. 50%, because it's indoors, and you're running 365 day operation, you're not just dealing with one harvest now, you're dealing with three. And because these are self-contained modules, the average typical warehouse is 24 feet high. This is the first time, because we're not using humans involved with normal greenhouse, we can stack these things. So say a tomato plant, six feet high, stack them four high. So the result is this. Oh, actually, that. So you go from the 36,000, 1.8 million. Now mind you, you can question some of the numbers on it, but either way, your yield is going to be dramatically higher and keep improving. And the best part about the whole thing is, you have perfect produce trying, uh, without 100% organic, free of E. coli, salmonella, predictable output 365 days a year, and locally grown. In fact, you can grow it here. You can grow these things in the Arctic. You can even do urban farming and reclaim some of these warehouses that are abandoned. But with, so what's the catch? With every process, there's trade-offs. So with traditional farming, we are using land, water to make produce. This one, we're using electricity to produce produce. And that's the major change here. But out of the three, land, water, or energy, which one's getting more scarce and which one's getting cheaper and more uh, abundant? So what I say is, let's stop thinking about what we can do with the faucet, 
and start thinking big and reaching far. Army and uh, automation robotics. Okay, fire away. Have you uh, have you seen uh, Chuck Bolte? Uh, have you seen models of this? Are you, you, I haven't seen the what the actual technology is. Actually, no, because you know why? There are no models of it. Uh, I got my um, master's degree from DePaul in computer science back in 2005. And my uh, thesis project was doing computer vision and doing uh, farming. Before that, I was actually in Iowa for a while doing uh, uh, computer vision for markers in the fields. But then that came the, the epiphany going, wait a minute, all I'm doing is, you know, the FGPS, you know, you're reinventing the wheel. Here, now with the technology coming out, especially with the connects and some of the 3D scanners, what was difficult challenge before during my um, thesis to do the uh, mapping of the tomatoes and the plants and have the robot touch it and, and, and manipulate it has gotten a lot easier. And the price point has gotten a lot lower because of all the major um, uh, movement going on. So no, you haven't seen it before because I, along with some others, are making it. Hey, Eric, I'm Eric. Uh, the uh, first and one thing, by the way, DePaul's computer science program came from NIU. So really? <laughs> oh, I see. I, I do today. Thank you. There you go. Um, but I, I'm curious, though, as far as, as you know, for today, if you look at farming, and, and, and I, 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 sometimes you go by uh, farms, and I was in, a, I'm trying to remember which country I was in, but people were saying, I think I was in Hawaii, it's like another country. But they're talking about no GMOs. Yes. And the whole thing of, of genetically modified. Uh, 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 any foods it seems to be kind of a big risk here. So I, I'd like to notice what you think about overall risk here. But then, how do you address this? Where it's not people look at this and are afraid of these types of things, and it kind of you get into that same effect area. I would think that's an excellent question. And because here's the thing, not only you're going to get some part of the, the fear on it, but you know by doing this, there's going to be a lot. Whoever, even if I don't do it, or team doesn't do it, there. Whoever, saw, whoever puts this out in production and finalizes it is going to be hated. They're going to be hated, well, just like uh, uh, Mark Lane said. You know, you say jobs, politicians want you. You're taking jobs away. You're automating everything. You say you take, a, 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 you know, you got Monsanto with the genetically modified crops. This is a disruption to everything they have built up. And of course, the politicians, I come from Iowa, and I worked for uh, ABC News out of Iowa. The politicians would hate me out of Iowa because I'm taking jobs out of the hardworking farmers. But what this does, though, is picture you having set up these things. Uh, one of the biggest uh, problems that we face is well, fresh produce in the middle of Chicago, south side, north side, no matter where. You can now set up these greenhouses in any location as long as you have electricity. So you can have fresh produce 365 days a year from in food deserts. And not only that, you can have it in Alaska, you can have it in Dubai, you can have it anywhere you need to put up food and do it. And it's not to replace the farms out here, never to replace the farms out here. This is actually an insurance policy on humanity because if anything disrupts this supply of food that we have, floods out, what, think about what you're going to do out in California with the, the droughts going on right now. That's going to be a major disruption. This is your insurance policy that hedges the risk of climate change and some other things. So, so it's, it's a clean focused business then? I mean, if I was yeah. to take what you're doing right there, mm -hmm. I think I would point that out and say, you know what, this is geographically focused and yeah. they can hone in on those areas that they can help out. Just like everyone, we are making it hyper local now to use a, another term for it. Because you, you can actually, if you own a restaurant, you can have one of these things right next door up on your roof for a Italian restaurant producing tomatoes that you can actually see pictures of, you know, because you can your vision, you get your report and say, you know what happened from, from seed all the way to the harvest. Tomatoes taste like cardboard this time of year, so yes. Yes, but here, unlike hydroponics, this is soil. We're dealing, because that's the other thing too, I agree with you, so you guys are horrible when they're hydroponics. Yeah. So, Ellie. I think we just effectively pointed out some of the challenges, uh, you know, like taking more jobs and yeah. <laughs> Uh, points of this, but to me what's interesting is that you're focusing, like you pitch this as something that's related to 
to water conservation, when I think that maybe your heart might be in a different part of this, right? Like you're really excited about the technology, about the hyper <coughs> local aspect of it. Why is this something that you're pitching as specifically a water conservation uh, initiative? And how much water do you actually see, like growing tomatoes, for example, in a different manner as opposed to the normal? Well, you know, I don't have the data on that. Uh, it's something I have to get for you. But really, you're dealing in a closed system now. So the only water leaving that system is the water that's actually in the produce. Everything else is contained. So when you add water to it, the only thing leaving is that. And one of the biggest uh, waste that we have is runoff on, uh, on farms. Most of, and you're right, there is a lot of directions I could have gone with it. And for me, you know, it's one of the things that you try to figure out where to pitch for. For me, I, I, I went, I was in Iowa for eight years. You cannot go to any river in Iowa and not drink the water and because it is so contaminated or so uh, filled with uh, runoff from the, um, uh, from all the nitrogen in the area that does the algae growth. That alone, there's, it's, there is no runoff. There is probably a half a dozen different directions you can go with this. But one of the things that with California going on right now and drought, it's going to really affect the country as a whole right now. Mm -hmm. May not be now, will be later this year. Water will be top later this year. One last question? Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, quick one? One quick one. Go ahead, go ahead. You got it in there at a time. Yeah, yeah. one quick one's got three parts. Um, <laughs> so, uh, number one, 39% uh, of water withdrawals in the United States go to so it's not as you, so the net water gains savings is somewhat questionable. Number two, uh, what, was, what was really interesting to me about this, that's not, so that's just like, I, I was just thinking about that, and I, I agree with you in terms of like the framing of it. You could frame this better where you're just going, hey, let's grow food more, more let's grow food differently. Uh, so number two, uh, tomatoes make for good pictures, but no, there's actually not a really good example for you. So, if I want to think about like soybeans or a very sort of like base level crop that um, is much easier, tomatoes are really hard to grow. Yes. So like what's a really easy crop to grow that you could do under this like alfalfa or something would be probably pretty awesome. And then so as a business model case, um, I would go read uh, Clayton Christensen who talks about disruptive innovation and look at the example of the rebar uh, industry and the steel industry and how the recycled steel mills uh, started by making rebar and then they got better and better at it and worked themselves up the steel food chain so now we're making jumbo jets out of uh, recycled uh, steel and I think you have a similar story that you can tell about the transformation of farming kind of from the ground up. Nice and to answer your question strawberries because you're only using this much room to grow strawberries versus tomatoes. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you.